God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes Unwilling to forsake their fellowship together, a small group of Christians quietly meets in a home. Although they are aware of the dangers of this secret meeting, they are unprepared for what awaits. What's going on in here? The communist soldiers terrorize the believers, shouting insults and threatening to kill them. The leading officer demands that the pastor hand over the Bible. His hatred for Christianity is revealed as he throws the word of God to the floor. He commands everyone to spit on the book of lies as they leave the building. Anyone who refuses will be shot. In this life or death situation, the believers have no choice. They reluctantly comply with the soldier's order. Father, please forgive me. Okay, you. forward. Overcome with love for her Lord, she picks up the book and wipes off the spit, asking God to forgive them. I did unto your word. Please forgive them. It will be her last prayer. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were slain, destitute, afflicted, tormented. They were of whom the world was not worthy. The author of Hebrews spoke about heroes of the faith, courageous men and women who lived and died before godless men. But what about today's persecuted Christians? Like the young Cambodian girl who gave her life at the hands of Khmer Rouge soldiers, her crime demonstrating her love by wiping spit from the Bible. Christians throughout the world continue to suffer for their faith in Jesus Christ, a faith that allows ordinary people to triumph in extraordinary circumstances. Beaten, tortured, imprisoned, they press on. Their undying love, a testimony to us all. The following are true stories of today's persecuted church our brothers and sisters, whose faith is under fire. Many Islamic nations have embraced a strict interpretation of Sharia law, which calls for the death of anyone found guilty of blasphemy against the Prophet Muhammad or even the Quran. The following dramatization tells the unbelievable story of Zahid, a former Muslim priest and persecutor of Christians who, like the Apostle Paul, would find out all that he must suffer for Jesus. It is told by Amir Shalom. Zahid was born into a Muslim family. His father and older brother were Muslim priests, and as expected, Zahid followed in their footsteps. Shortly after Zahid was assigned to his first mosque, his hatred and intolerance of Christians began to show itself. I would gather the young men from my mosque and incite them against the Christians. I, I explained to them that Christians were infidels. I told them to, to beat the Christians with, with sticks and iron rods. It was our duty and Allah would be pleased. Until that day, the, a youth returned with the Bible. He was tearing out the pages and suggested that we burn it. On previous occasions, we have burned Bibles that were collected. However, this time, I felt compelled to take it home with me. I was reading the Bible, looking for contradictions I could use against the Christian faith. When all of a sudden, a great light appeared in my room. And then I heard a voice call my name. The light, it was so bright, it had lit the entire room. And then the voice asked, 
Zahid, why do you persecute me? I was scared. I didn't know what to do. I thought I was dreaming. <laughs> so I asked, who are you? And then I heard, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. For the next three nights, the light and voice returned. And finally, on the fourth night, I knelt down and I accepted Jesus as my savior. Following Zahid's dramatic conversion, he went to his family members and others in the mosque to share the events which had unfolded over the past few nights. According to Islamic teaching, Zahid was now considered an apostate and turned over to the authorities. I was in prison for two years. And during this time, the guards repeatedly tortured me. On one occasion, they tied me to the ceiling fan by my hair, just left me hanging. They also pulled out my fingernails in an attempt to break my faith. But although I suffered greatly at the hands of my Muslim captors, I held no bitterness towards them. Because just a few years before, I was one of them. During my trial, I was found guilty of blasphemy. And according to the Shari law, I was to be executed by hanging. They tried to force me to recount my faith in Jesus. They assured me that if I cooperated, there would be no more beatings, no more humiliation. I could go free. But I could not deny Jesus. Muhammad had never visited me. Jesus had. I know he is the truth. So I just prayed for the gods, hoping that they would also come to know Jesus. Unafraid of death, Zahid attempted to share Jesus with his persecutors during what he believed were the final minutes of his life. Although Zahid had accepted his fate, God had another plan. <laughs> Moments before the hanging, an order was unexpectedly issued by the court to release Zahid, stating that there was not enough evidence against him. To this day, no one knows why Zahid was suddenly allowed to go free. Now I tell people that Jesus had visited me twice. Once, when I was a persecutor of his children, and the second time, when I was to be hanged. Zahid has since changed his name to Lazarus, testifying of his narrow escape from death. Although many Christians did not trust him at first, they have now received him into their family and assist Lazarus as he travels from village to village. I live in a land ruled by the false teaching of Islam. My people are blinded and I was chosen by God to be his voice. I count all that I've suffered nothing compared to the the endless joy of knowing him, the way, the truth, and the life. Although not every conversion from Islam is as dramatic as Zahid's, hundreds of thousands of Christians face constant danger from Muslim officials, neighbors, and even their own family members. Islamic writings and present law clearly reveals that anyone who turns away from their Muslim faith is to be executed. This segment of Faith Under Fire is dedicated to Christians like Zahid, persecuted in Muslim nations, and to the silent heroes who have given their lives for their testimony of Jesus Christ. While many in the Western world believe communism is dead, 1.2 billion people, over 20% of the world's population, remain in the mouth of the dragon. For nearly 50 years, Chinese communists have dominated everyday life, 
and sought to bring an end to Christianity. It started in October of 1949, when communist dictator Mao Zedong proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China, bringing an end to religious growth and liberty. Thousands of pastors and Christian leaders soon disappeared into the dark recesses of communist prison and labor camps. Following the initial crackdown, the persecution heightened. Mao's cultural revolution brought about the open persecution of anyone courageous enough to proclaim their faith. Christians were publicly arrested, beaten, and killed. Nearly all Bibles and Christian literature was destroyed, burned in the streets by Mao's Red Guard. A glimpse of hope came after Mao's death in 1976, when Deng Xiaoping, the new party leader, committed himself to modernization. Although persecution and arrests continued, the house church meetings began to multiply as millions of Chinese committed their lives to Jesus Christ. Then came Tiananmen Square. As countless Chinese students gathered outside the forbidden city, China continued its massacre of human life and once again tightened its grip on the church. Pastor Li Di Shen, himself a former Communist Party member, has been specifically targeted because of his role in the house church movement. Li shares the events which unfolded during a recent visit to Beijing. We left for Shahua village at 9 o'clock in the morning and met a group of brothers. After breakfast, we prayed together and departed for Beijing. We left our motorcycles outside the city and walked to the meeting place. The believers were already gathered upon our arrival. After kneeling to pray, we sang together and they sat quietly on the floor. The public security bureau broke in shortly after I began to deliver my sermon. They shouted at me, you come out. I replied, please wait for a moment, listen to us and judge for yourself whether it is good or bad to believe in Jesus. But they did not listen. Ignoring his offer, the officers grabbed Lee and dragged him outside. All Bibles were confiscated and the names of those present were recorded for future reprisals. One of the officers began assaulting Lee in front of his congregation. Members of his church, horrified by the beatings, quickly rushed to the aid of their pastor. When they saw I was being beaten, they immediately surrounded me with their own bodies to protect me. The officers, realizing they were outnumbered by the congregation, called the local police station. A group of fully armed officers came to arrest us. Many of the women were sexually molested during the arrest. As soon as we arrived at the police station, they started beating me with a stick. The superintendent of the police led the attack. He twisted my arm around my back, forcing me to bend over. They kicked me with their feet and knees and hit me with their elbows. After the beatings, the superintendent discovered the Bible, which Lee had hidden before the arrest. Disgusted by his persistence, the officer struck the pastor with his own Bible before having him dragged to an isolation cell. Lee was released later that day with broken ribs and other injuries. However, his main concern was retaining his Bible. This Bible is very important to me because I have written many of my personal notes on the Gospels in it. After returning home, I felt pain all over my body. It was almost numb at the beginning, but later became so painful that I could not sleep. Pastor Lee Duchenne is a living martyr. His courage and perseverance has been an encouragement to hundreds of Christians throughout the province of Guangdong. Despite the cost, Lee continues to stand before the dragon, bring the testimony of Jesus Christ to the lost souls of China. Humanly speaking, we know that no one likes to suffer physically, but I know that if the Lord leads me into it, he will give me the strength to survive. The devastating effects of persecution often extend beyond the lives of the victims. Family members, sharing in the suffering or loss of a loved one, experience their own torment. Lin Dao, 
A Vietnamese Christian from Saigon is a perfect example of how the families of persecuted Christians must deal with such tragic situations. I cried almost every single night because I worried how my father was doing in prison and how the policemen were treating him. I remember when they came. They searched around the house all of that morning and asked many different questions. It was scary to talk to the policemen but I knew what they were looking for, so I concentrated and tried my best not to be scared or nervous. When the policeman decided to take my dad away, all of my family knelt down and prayed. I prayed first, then my sister, then my mom, and last of all, my dad. I prayed that my dad would have peace and remain healthy and that my family would survive these hard times. We were all crying, but I told myself I have to face what is happening now. I marked on my bookcase and counted every single day. I was sad because my house was so lonely after my father left. Pastor Vin Trung was arrested and told that he would spend the next three years in prison for his evangelistic activities outside of the government-controlled Tin Lon Church. By sharing in her father's suffering, Lynn's own faith matured. She began to realize the kind of commitment which love requires, a love for Jesus reaching beyond human understanding. Before my dad was in prison, I was just a child. I didn't need to worry about anything. It was a lot different after my dad left. My mind got older very quickly. I told my sister that we had to help mom do the work around the house so she could continue to do my dad's work in the church. I prayed every day and every night. My faith grew very fast. I knew one thing that I had to concentrate on, and that was spending time learning from the Bible. So when I grew up, I could be like my dad, sharing and preaching. When I think about this, I feel my heart burning inside me, pushing me, telling me this is the right thing to do. One day I told my mom I missed him so bad. I wished I could trade with him so he could get out of prison. Then I could get into prison and replace him. I couldn't do anything else to help him, so that is the only thing that I wanted to do. Eventually, Pastor Vin was transferred to Phan Dang Lu Prison in the Bon Tran District. For the first time in many months, Lin Dao and her family would be able to visit him. I was excited when we got ready to visit my dad. There was a fence separating us from daddy. I ran toward him, but the fence stopped me. I discovered a small opening in the gate that I could squeeze through and get inside to give my dad a hug. The policeman looked at me, but he didn't do anything because I was just a child. My heart hurt when I saw how my daddy looked. He didn't have good food in prison. I ran up and hugged him with all of my heart. In that place, there was a wire fence, and the police stood nearby to hear us talking. The time was very short. We had five to ten minutes, only enough time to exchange greetings and encourage one another. The guards only allowed a short visit, and it would be a year before Lynn would see her daddy again. During this visit, Trung's family was able to smuggle him an ink pen cartridge hidden in the fruit they delivered. Although Vin was later caught with the pen and denied any additional packages for many months, this small gift proved to be an invaluable tool. My wife put a pen inside the food she had brought. There was no paper in prison, but there were cigarettes, so we used the boxes and cigarette paper to write tiny notes and songs. The guards discovered Pastor Vin talking to the other prisoners many times. He was strictly warned against this and often had his food rations withheld for two days because of the offense. Wanting to dampen Vin's zeal, the prison officials forced him into hard labor along the Cambodian border. Every day in labor camp, I could meet with other prisoners to teach them and train them. It is a rare chance to be in prison. It is an opportunity to meet many people. 
They encouraged me to join the Communist Party. They said I would be able to bring many people into the party because of the strong influence of my preaching. I told them the proverb says, the heart of a king is in the hands of the Lord, and God could turn the party upside down, like God turned upside down Gorbachev's communism. After six months of hard labor, they transferred him to another prison, where he again found a new group of cellmates anxious to hear the gospel. The guards, suspecting Ben's activities, assured him there was an isolation cell waiting for him. The cell was only three feet by six feet. The roof was a metal grate. It did not keep out the sun or rain. It only kept the prisoner in. It was very hot in the day and cold in the night. There were cockroaches, and mice, ants, and small snakes in the cell. It was very dirty. All of the prisoners were horrified of this place. After being in the isolation cell for two weeks, I could take no more. I thought I would never teach again. Pastor Vin thought his life would end in a brutal isolation cell reserved for hardened criminals. For over three years, he had diligently labored in more than five prison and labor camps, bringing many to Christ. His cigarette paper sermons also traveled from cell to cell, encouraging the new believers. But God was not finished with his servant. It was a big surprise for me when I came home from school one day and saw my dad had been released from prison. I ran in and gave him a big hug. We were so happy. I was proud of my family, and I wanted to yell and let the whole world know that I wasn't scared of anything, because God always protects each step I go in my life. I'm Chris Peace. The testimonies you have just witnessed are true. They are a glimpse into the lives of today's persecuted church. Although persecution is not a popular subject in the Western world, it has become a way of life for countless Christians in restricted nations. For them, faith comes with a price. Not every Christian is called to become a martyr or even suffer for their faith. But we are all called to take part, to remember those in bonds and those who are ill-treated for the sake of the gospel. The question remains, what will we do? Will we shy away from the suffering of our brothers and sisters? Or will we find ways to get involved and even allow their testimonies of overcoming faith to strengthen us? years, the Voice of the Martyrs has been actively serving the needs of the persecuted church. 
reaching out in more than 50 nations. The ministry daily assists these courageous saints with practical help and spiritual encouragement while making their voice heard. The vision was formed many years earlier when a Romanian pastor was imprisoned for his faith. On February 29th of 1948, Richard Wormbrandt was confined to a solitary cell hidden 30 feet beneath the earth. His only companions were his captors who repeatedly subjected him to inhuman tortures that revealed the depth of evil found within the hearts of unredeemed men. In darkness and despair, Pastor Wormbrandt discovered the hidden secrets of his loving Savior and the inner strength to endure. It is also during this time that he envisioned a ministry that would proclaim the suffering of God's children and reveal Christ's faithfulness and undying love. A ministry that would wake up the Western world to the atrocities committed against his brothers and sisters. Finally, in 1964, after spending 14 years in communist prisons, Pastor Richard Wormbrandt, his wife Sabina, and son Mahai were ransomed from Romania for $10,000. Expecting to see a feeble, defeated man, the world witnessed a spiritual giant who overcame desperate situations through his love for Christ. Pastor Wormbrandt's calling became clear as he traveled around the world, speaking out on behalf of his persecuted brothers and sisters. He quickly became known as the voice of the underground church. In 1967, Tortured for Christ was released, along with the first edition of The Voice of the Martyrs, a small newsletter exposing the tragic situations facing believers in oppressive lands and encouraging Christians around the world to remember those in bonds. Three decades later, the ministry remains true to its call. And as we approach the 21st century, we continue to witness the persecution of Christ's body. Tom White, director of the Voice of the Martyrs USA office, has dedicated the past 25 years to this service. The vision and purpose of the Voice of the Martyrs is continually confirmed by these modern day martyrs who in the face of persecution, torture and death, press toward the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. They are indeed God's heroes. The persecuted church is served by the ministry's five main goals. To bring relief to families of Christian martyrs, helping them to rebuild their lives. To equip those in restricted nations with Bibles, special literature, and radio broadcasts in their own language. To strengthen the persecuted church assisting them in the Great Commission, to win to Christ those who oppose the gospel, and to inform the world of the atrocities committed against God's children and encourage others with their testimonies of overcoming faith. The Voice of the Martyrs newsletter highlights the current situation facing today's persecuted church. Each month, you can be encouraged as you read their inspiring testimonies Learn to pray specifically for those who are persecuted for their faith and find practical ways to get involved. By partaking in the sufferings of Christ, by remembering the persecution of our brothers and sisters, we can experience a new strength, a hope that shines through every obstacle, the joy of knowing Him, the perfecter of our faith. To receive a free subscription to the Voice of the Martyrs monthly newsletter, Call 1-800-747-0085 or write to the Voice of the Martyrs, Post Office Box 443, Bartlesville, Oklahoma, 74003.